Hello ladies and gentlemen, it's the Historical Gamer once again, and today I'm going to be playing Order of Battle Pacific, the new turn-based war game put out by the Aristocrats and published by Matrix and Slytherin Games. I've played the first two scenarios in the Imperial Japanese campaign, having bombed Pearl Harbor and destroyed all the American battleships therein, as well as attacking Manila. Uh, actually, no, this is the fourth scenario. I attacked Manila, took Manila, and then I took the remainder of the Philippines and the Bataan Peninsula. So this is part six of my series, and in this, we're going to be playing the Battle of Java Sea. Now, this scenario takes place after the fall of the Philippines to the Japanese, and is really part of Japan's efforts to secure resources. We had discussed earlier that the reason the Japanese attacked the Philippines in the first place was that the Philippines acted as a natural barrier between Japan and the resources in their southern resources area, uh, more, I guess you could say more accurately, the Dutch East Indies, the area that the Dutch nation continued to hold as colonies, the islands of Java, uh, Balkapin, uh, Sumatra, basically the islands in the area of Indonesia, Borno and, and those areas, uh, were all highly resource rich. The Japanese wanted those islands. They badly needed those islands, largely because of U.S. oil embargoes and obviously now being at war with the United States meant that the Japanese needed to find other avenues for getting oil for their fleet and for their industry in order for them to continue to expand and even just to be able to, to fight basic uh, operations in defense of their current holdings, let alone expand. So the Japanese needed oil badly. The United States in the 1940s was still, I believe, the world's largest, if not largest, one of the world's largest oil producing nations, uh, and also uh, one of the world's largest exporting oil nations. There's actually laws in place that prevent the United States from exporting oil right now, but uh, at the time, the United States was one of the world's largest oil exporters. So, right now, this is a scenario, it's going to be a naval scenario, as you can see here. We don't control everything, there are computer-controlled uh, units on the map that are transports, and then the uh, warships are controlled by us, the, uh, the Japanese player. So, this particular scenario focuses on the Battle of the Java Sea, but the Java Sea wasn't really one naval engagement. It was a series of naval engagements which took place over a couple of weeks uh, where the Japanese were closing in on the islands of the southeast Dutch, in or southeast, I keep confusing the southern resources area as the Japanese called it, uh, and the Dutch East Indies. But essentially, the Japanese are closing in on the Dutch East Indies, uh, present day uh, Indonesia and the allies are going to try and stop them. Now the command which would face up against this Japanese fleet was called ABDA, that stood for American, British, Dutch, and Australian. Those were the different nations that had their warships uh, combined in a motley collection of cruisers and destroyers uh, for the defense of this area. The American ships came from the Philippines, where they had recently retreated from. Originally, they were based out of Caveat Naval Base in the Bay of Manila, uh, which had suffered immensely from the initial Japanese attacks against those islands. Some serious air raids did far more damage to the naval facilities there than really anything else except for maybe the attacks on Clark Field, which had devastated the Air Force. So the defenders in the Philippines were left basically without a fleet and without an air force. The air force was destroyed on the ground. What few planes survived uh, had withdrawn. Uh, I don't believe any of the fighters withdrew, but the bombers that had survived withdrew to Australia. While the fleet that survived largely intact uh, withdrew to the Dutch East Indies. Uh, it was more further removed from the uh, Japanese air bases in surrounding areas. And so it allowed the Americans and all the other naval vessels there to operate a little bit more effectively than if they were in the Philippines where the Japanese had hundreds and hundreds of aircraft readily available. So there is that aspect which made it a more tenable position. Also the American fleet was able to combine with the Dutch defenders which had several cruisers, four or five cruisers I believe. And the British would eventually bring down their own fleet as well which would make the force far stronger. 
Now, the fleet originally started a bit stronger. It was more than just a handful of cruisers and some destroyers uh, at its onset. The ABDA command was actually formed in an effort to defend the entire Malay uh, boundary, as it was called, just this kind of fictional line which presumed the Malay Peninsula, much of modern-day Indonesia, uh, and the Philippines was also included in the command. And the idea was essentially to prevent the Japanese expansion into this resource-rich area to protect Singapore, to protect Java, and basically have this kind of barrier against the Indian Ocean and uh, Australia. Uh, however, on December 10th, the British lost the two most powerful warships in the squadron, or in the fleet, or whatever you want to call it. They were part of a force designated Force Z, and three destroyers and the British battlecruiser Repulse and battleship Prince of Wales sortied from their base in Singapore to intercept Japanese troop transports which were landing troops near Kota Baru on the Malay, Malay Peninsula in Japan's attempt to take Singapore. Now the ships were spotted by Japanese submarines and their position was relayed to Japanese bomber bases which were located in French Indochina which had been turned over to Japanese control, de facto anyway, uh, at the uh, I believe it was sold or either that or just the French, uh, Vichy French were cooperating with them. Either way, the Japanese had de facto control over French Indochina and launched a series of air raids with heavy aircraft, GM-3 uh, Nels and GM-4 Betty bombers armed with torpedoes and bombs, launched multiple raids against the British fleet, and the British battlecruiser Repulse and battleship Prince of Wales were both sunk before they were able to intercept any vessels or get back to safety. It's an interesting example because prior to this, air attacks against capital ships at sea uh, had largely been ineffective in sinking them. They had damaged the Bismarck earlier, uh, but they hadn't actually sunk any capital ships, to my knowledge, uh, at sea. Uh, they had launched successful attacks just a couple months earlier at Pearl Harbor. Well, no, earlier that same month. And they had launched successful attacks against Italian battleships at the port of Tarento. But this may have been the first example of a capital ship being sunk outright by air units alone uh, while in motion, while essentially at sea. So this was a pretty big moment, uh, something that would foreshadow a lot of what would happen later in World War II. So, just like that, a few days after the Americans enter the war, a few days after the Japanese begin attacking British possessions, and the two most powerful ships in the Southwest Pacific are at the bottom of the ocean. Uh, they were sunk just off Kuntan, I'm sure I'm pronouncing that wrong, and the ABDA force was greatly reduced in its firepower. The American vessels, as we had said already, had withdrawn to the Dutch East Indies as a result largely of the Philippines uh, no longer being a tenable base, simply being too close to enemy uh, aircraft and enemy locations on Formosa and other bases nearby. And as a result, uh, the as the Philippines slowly fell, Allied forces began to concentrate uh, near Java in the southwest Pacific, Java being part of the Dutch East Indies or modern-day Indonesia. The force consisted of two heavy cruisers, the USS Houston, which had come from the Asiatic fleet as it withdrew from the Philippines, and the HMS Exeter, which had recently joined the Pacific after re repairs which had occurred in Britain after its historic engagement with the German battlecruiser Graf Spee, or I guess pocket battleship would be more accurate. The Exeter had suffered serious damage in 1940 in its engagement with the Graf Spee, and at one point it was debated whether it should actually be scrapped. It wasn't, however, and it went through a serious modernization program which took several months. At the time it came out of uh, being its being repaired, it was one of the most modern cruisers in the entire British fleet, uh, and was still one of the most modern cruisers in the entire British fleet, a heavy cruiser with 8-inch guns, just like the Houston. Both of these warships very powerful and very capable. Now, it's interesting to point out that during the engagements with the Japanese uh, near the Dutch East Indies, neither fleet, the Japanese or the Americans, or the British or the Australians, etc., would bring to bear any battleships. So these heavy cruisers, these two heavy cruisers, were very capable, especially given the fact that they were up against likewise opponents. So that's worth keeping in mind. In addition to that, the fleet also had seven light cruisers, in including one of the very best versions of, of light cruisers available, the USS Boise, which had tremendous fire firepower, 
for a light cruiser, and over 20 destroyers, more than 25 U.S. submarines, and 16 Dutch submarines. The American submarine force started with 29 submarines in the Philippines, uh, but had pulled back from the Philippines to rebase itself out of the Dutch East Indies. So again, the American fleet largely escaped the Philippines intact and was a huge component in the engagements during the defense of the Dutch East Indies. With that said, that large force of American submarines was largely rendered useless because of the tactics that were employed, as well as the ineffectiveness of their torpedoes. Uh, fun fact, American submarine captains, uh, while the fleet had a very high opinion of their ability to engage enemy warships, were incredibly cautious. Um, I've read a, or a good portion of a very good book called Silent Victory, which is a eight, 900 page book of the American submarine war in the Pacific. And it describes some of the tactics which American submariners would use during this early war period, included some absolutely insanely ineffective tactics. Americans were at an absolutely uh, delusional sense of how effective Japanese anti-submarine warfare technology was. Uh, in fact, the Japanese didn't think that American subs could dive to below something like, I think, 250 feet. So Japanese depth charges weren't even designed to be able to go below 250 feet, even though almost every single U.S. submarine could get well below that, sometimes by over 100 feet. So all the Americans would have to do is just dive deep enough and there'd be absolutely no chance that the Japanese would sink them, uh, which was very interesting to me. Um, but as it was, the American tactics, again, because they were so afraid of anti-submarine technology, like depth charges, was to fire their torpedoes entirely based off of sonar readings, which is absolutely crazy in this day and age. Uh, you know, you don't have uh, guided torpedoes, so you really need to get a good bearing. You need to be able to see your target through the periscope or even ideally at the surface and then make a whole bunch of mathematical calculations on where the torpedo should go. As it was, American captains would waste dozens and dozens of torpedoes by basically firing them off blind from hundreds of feet below the surface and then compound the fact with the fact that the American torpedoes were absolute garbage at this time and often would run 30, 40 feet underneath their target and accomplish absolutely nothing. So while 25 submarines sounds like a lot, the American submarines were largely worthless and their crews were highly inexperienced and their captains were very, very cautious. Uh, all coupling or all adding to the fact that the Japanese, while this fleet seems large on paper, I mean, that's over 30 surface warships and over 40 submarines. That sounds like a strong force to defend these islands with. But the fact is, uh, the Japanese Navy was absolutely uh, massive at this time, and even just cruisers and destroyers heavily outgunned the Americans, before you even include the fact that the Americans and the British and the Australians didn't have nearly the same kind of air power that the Japanese had to bear as well. Japanese had a qualitative edge in terms of torpedoes, qualitative edge in terms of experience and in many cases training. They also had the fact that they weren't four different navies trying to operate as one. I think that's another fact that gets missed a lot is during the Dutch East Indy campaign you had British, American, Dutch, and Australian navies all trying to operate together as one cohesive unit when they had never really trained to do that before. This isn't 1980s NATO, which is regular, regularly training amongst themselves. This is one of the earliest examples, especially for the Americans, of having to operate with another fleet uh, and try and be effective while doing it. So all of these factors combined to make the ABDA command incredibly inefficient. Yet despite that, they did attempt to put up quite a, a valiant fight, and while it wasn't successful, uh, they certainly were brave in the way they went about it. So that's the general situation in February of 1942 and the condition of the Allied fleet. Now, in the game, you can see here in the northern half of the map, we've got what looks to be the Dutch Navy attacking a, a very small Japanese squadron of a couple of destroyers and a cruiser uh, pretty successfully thus far here earlier in the battle up in the north. Uh, we've got the Dutch cruiser HLMS Trump as well as two Dutch destroyers getting the early edge on us. In the south, we're engaging the American fleet. Uh, this looks to be... There's a cruiser here. We've already taken care of some destroyers. We've included the battleship Nagato. We purchased the battleship Nagato for use in this battle. Um, the Japanese, as we've already said, didn't have any battleships uh, 
in this uh, this part of the, the the naval campaign, but we've got them on our own anyway. We've gone ahead and we've sunk a destroyer or a Japanese. Oh goodness, I can't speak. We've gone ahead and sunk an American submarine. We've already talked about how ineffective the Japanese were in their dealings with American submarines, but uh, we sank uh, one there as it is. Uh, actually, it looks like we've sunk two now. I believe uh, is it two or one? I don't know. Um, and we're closing in here to finish off this American cruiser. Uh, we can also use torpedoes from our destroyers. The Japanese uh, naval tactics relied heavily on the use of torpedoes for their surface engagements. They had an absolutely fantastic uh, torpedo for use by their surface warships. It was called the Long Lance. Uh, a very fast, very, very long-ranged torpedo that the Japanese were trained to use very effectively and uh, really gave them some serious advantages in the early naval engagements over the Americans who had much shorter range torpedoes for their surface ships and for their submarines, uh, basically totally ineffective torpedoes for their surface ships. So that's one advantage that the Japanese historically had and it's one that we have here. We can see there's also a British uh, submarine that's been deployed. I'm not sure if the British deployed any submarines to the Battle of the Java Sea. Uh, but I do know that, uh, obviously, that's one right there that we just damaged. Uh, so you can see that. Our goal in this particular battle is to defend the troop transports and supply ships uh, in order to have uh, a more effective ability to resist, uh, or not to resist, a more effective ability to take over the islands that we want to take over. But it doesn't seem that actually landing troops or anything along those lines is going to be a factor or anything that we do in this actual a battle. One thing I'm uncertain about though here is some of these Dutch ships and I think the Americans one showed it earlier kind of have like half of a Dutch flag and then half of this weird like red X type thing. I'm not quite sure uh, what that is. Um, so yeah. But anyway we got a special event. We've taken uh, the island of Bali uh, and we're putting air forces into that because some of the other islands are socked in uh, with rain. I'm trying to get these uh, tor or fighter bombers up to the north to aid that fleet up there before it gets totally destroyed. And you can see here I've run into some naval mines. That's another thing that the game has. Uh, naval minefields are something that can pose a serious threat to warships. You can see there I think we just lost three out of ten of that uh, heavy cruiser to those mines that uh, we hadn't spotted as we advanced. You can see here those destroyers have spotted another minefield. Uh, so it does appear that the Dutch have uh, successfully mined these areas uh, and are going to be a bit of a nuisance. Uh, meanwhile, again, trying to get our bombers up there. Not sure if they're going to arrive in time. Uh, the Dutch are uh, being kind of jerks right now. They're uh, being very effective with regards to delaying us. Uh, probably should ignore these the British submarine. Submarines don't seem to be too effective against warships. Uh, but as it is, uh, I've decided to go ahead and, and try and deal with them. So I'm not uh, fighting this uh, campaign up in the north very effectively. Uh, it definitely seems like the more you move, the less effective your gun gunfire is, which is an interesting element to the game. Uh, it seems to be realistic. You know, if you constantly change your speed, if you crank your speed up and start going real fast, and then you crank your speed down, and then you crank it up again, it's going to make gunfire much more difficult than if you just keep a constant speed. That being said, it would also make you more difficult uh, to hit if your speed and course is constantly changing. I'm not sure if that's reflected in the game or not. Also, I'm not sure about the effectiveness of surface torpedoes. They seem a little bit undergunned to me. Um, maybe that's just me, but it, it seems like they should be a little bit more powerful than, than they are. Um, so we got a little alert saying that the invasion force for Java is being prepared and warships are going to be provided to escort them. But they seem... I don't know. Japanese long lance torpedoes played decisive roles in several battles during the Guadalcanal campaign. And it just seems to me like maybe they should be a little bit more powerful than they are uh, in this game. At least in this particular battle, it seems like they're only doing one hit damage. I can see them being less effective against destroyers because they're much faster and harder to hit. So if the Japanese were to launch a torpedo at a destroyer, it's less likely that it would hit it. But I feel like they should probably be more effective against um, against capital ships than they are. Also worth noting is, while the Japanese didn't employ any battleships in the surface actions during the Java Sea campaign, uh, it is worth mentioning that 
they did manage to um, use the use the battleships during the attacks on the Malay Peninsula. So as the troops uh, were coming ashore, uh, two Congo-class battleships, uh, which are were some of the Japanese earliest, maybe they were the first actual Japanese battle cruisers uh, that were over 20 years old, were utilized in that role. They didn't use the Nagato, but they did have two battleships that did take part in the Singapore campaign. They also had four fleet carriers, some of them already back from the attack on Pearl Harbor, which could have been brought to bear against the Allies uh, during the campaign against Java as well. So they had access to these other ships. The Japanese had more destroyers than the Allies had total ships. I mentioned that the Allies had some 40 surface warships, 20 of them being destroyers, uh, while the uh, Allies had... Um, the 40 warships, the Japanese had over 58 destroyers just by themselves. Uh, in addition to the two battleships and four carriers that they could bring to bear, uh, they had, I think it was about a dozen cruisers also. Um, the majority of the Allied fleet would be destroyed decisively. Uh, we're trying to sail our fleet here north to deal with these Dutch. The goal was to save the troop transport up in the north, but I don't think we're going to get there in time. And another one of my ships runs into a minefield. So these minefields are being much more effective uh, and uh, detrimental to my gameplay uh, than they were to the actual uh, Allied fleet anyway. So you see here, if we stay stationary again, we've got a chance of hitting the enemy. If we sail away, our chances drop. And some of that is range. And again, some of that seems to be movement. So almost just kind of standing and fighting gives you a better chance than kind of running and fighting. So that's interesting. Uh, here we go, we can see an American ship and some more Dutch ships are now coming in and attacking this troop transport with some infantry troops on it. Uh, looks like that ship is more or less doomed. Um, I can't control it. If I could, I would pull it out, but the game doesn't let me. And my cruiser can't hit anything either, so that's lovely. Uh, I'd be interested to see how the game models uh, gun accuracy as well because it is worth noting that the Japanese, while having pretty good gunnery, uh, didn't use fire control radars like the Americans did later in the war. So I think that'll be an interesting uh, comparison is to see the quality that the, the Japanese would have in terms of naval gunnery, if that's reflected in the game. It's also worth noting that the Japanese were not nearly as advanced as their Western counterparts when it came to fire control, uh, for, or not fire control, when it came to damage control. Uh, so the Japanese ships often would take levels of damage that the Americans would easily be able to repair, but the Japanese weren't trained along those lines and uh, would often lose ships that probably didn't need to be lost. But you can see here uh, they're going to finish off that uh, transport ship probably with torpedoes, I would imagine. Uh, no, they're going to launch torpedoes against our cruiser, and there they go. They hit it twice. So, just as I was complaining that torpedoes aren't effective enough, they go and deal a pretty good hit on our cruiser, and then they finish off the troop transport. So this cruiser of ours is probably dead. They just launched more torpedoes against it, this time only damaging once, and uh, some naval gunfire as well. So this light cruiser of ours in the north, probably done. Um, you can see here the enemy's destroyed several transport ships, causing significant loss of life and equipment. Our inability to protect the invasion force will impact something. Um, I didn't get a chance to finish reading that. Anyway, we can pull our, tr our ships out here to the north. You can see these little red uh, arrows pointing up with these lines that indicates the ability to pull those ships off the map and save them from enemy destruction. Meanwhile, our dive bombers finally arrived, and they are ever so effective against destroyers. Much less so against cruisers, but again, ever so effective against destroyers, uh, severely damaging that destroyer, uh, and uh, as the rest of our fleet is sailing north to try and come to their aid. Um, worth noting that while it may seem like a bad thing that we lost some transports to enemy ships, that actually happened in real life. In one of the few engagements in which the ABDA force had a successful attack, uh, the Japanese were actually landing, sh landing soldiers on the island of Borno uh, near the city of Balkapin. This actually took place before this scenario started. It took place on January 23rd and 24th, I believe. The Japanese were landing troops uh, on the island of Borno in an attempt to take the oil wells there. There were some of the most uh, lucrative oil wells in the entire southeast uh, or southwest Pacific. And the Americans dispatched 
four destroyers, uh, four kind of older four-stack destroyers to attempt to intercept this fleet. They launched torpedoes against them and actually sank six Japanese troop transports with some significant loss of life. Uh, however, it wasn't enough to stop the invasion. It didn't play a significant role, and the, uh, the Japanese invasion continued. It was one of the few successes, however, uh, for the ABDA command in which they sank six troop transports without loss of their own in a pretty courageous act by those uh, troop sh those uh, destroyer captains at long odds to be able to, to launch that kind of an attack, which was a surprise attack uh, against the Japanese. As we continue to try and pull out our light cruiser, it probably won't make it, but we did pull that one destroyer out of our northern force, and uh, I think we'll start shifting the rest of our fleet to the west because it's clear they're not going to arrive. So we've got the invasion force of Java, which has just come onto the map in the northeast, or sorry, northwest corner. So I want to get our surface fleet over there to defend them as quick as we can in case there's a larger, more powerful enemy fleet around, we need to make sure that we're keeping our troops safe. Uh, we can't lose more than a certain number of them where we lose the battle. So we have to, again, make sure that we're keeping them safe, and that's what I'll start to do. Now, one other thing that I haven't mentioned yet is the command points which limit how many troops or how many units you can have on the map uh, at any one time, essentially how many you can have under your command at any one time. Uh, is different for every type of unit. So I didn't actually realize this until just now. But if you look on the bottom of the map, bottom right side of the map, you'll see the coins, you know, the 234 coins to the right of that Japanese flag, and we're talking right above the mini-map on the bottom right. Um, that's how much money you have to buy new units. To the right of that, there's a zero next to a helmet. That's how many land forces you can have, essentially ground units you can have under your command in a core at any given time. But to the right of that, there is a anchor with a number four next to it, and then to the right of that, there is an aircraft with a number six next to it. So what the aircraft represents is the number of air units that you can support, not the straight number. Remember, different units have different values. So a battleship, for example, has a value of five, where you can have five, uh, you know, it uses five command points, essentially, whereas a destroyer might only use two. So you know how many command points you have that you can you can buy units with is represented by those numbers so right now we can't purchase any land units which is fine we've got a relatively large land core but they're not on the map right now because this is a naval engagement and then we've also got a relatively large uh, naval force on the map but we can fit four more command points so that would be equivalent to a heavy cruiser that we could purchase and add to the battlefield or we've got six air units, so we could purchase a couple of air units. Probably at least two, I would imagine. I think a tactical bomber is about three uh, in terms of its command points, whereas a strategic bomber is a level four commitment, I believe. I'd have to check on the, on the map there, but uh, that's what I believe it is anyway. And as you can see here, the fleet is continuing its, its march east, southeastward, uh, with the two destroyers in tow. Uh, we also... What do we do? Did we just lose that cruiser up there in the north? Um, and then our fleet is coming to the west to try and link up with them and guard against any potential enemy surface fleets. So we're kind of spreading the destroyers out here in a screen up front with our battleship and cruisers in tow and the aircraft carrier all the way in the rear. The one thing that does concern me, though, is now that I've lost those ships in the north, is these enemy ships may well close in and kind of crush us between two forces, one in the east, one in the west. Again, we don't know where the enemy naval forces are yet, but that would certainly be a concern if those enemy units do link up. Uh, fortunately, it doesn't seem like they're too strong in the north, just one cruiser and two destroyers, but again, uh, I don't want to get caught between two enemy forces. That would not be a good thing. So, uh, fleet continues to move, and we continue to screen. That's where we're at right about now. Uh, it's February 18th. We have to have at least two transport ships survive. Destroy or repulse all enemy ships is another primary objective. Uh, again, we can destroy them all or we can just repulse them, which I believe repulsing them would equal just surviving through the 18 turns with at least two ships left. Here we go, moving these ships further west again. 
and we're kind of closing in at the end of this uh, video, I believe. Uh, what I think I'm going to do is I'm going to go ahead and cut this video off in a couple of minutes, maybe like three or four more minutes, and then we'll have the second part finish up the scenario. We're almost halfway through all the turns. Uh, I'm, fl I'm moving the carrier to the north because you saw that dive bomber had those red hexes, which meant that it was running low on fuel. Essentially, it had to turn back right then and there to be able to reach a friendly airbase. Well, the aircraft carrier can land these aircraft because they are carrier capable, and uh, I'll move them and rendezvous them uh, as the enemy fleet is now uh, moving southwest, uh, probably chasing our aircraft, uh, figuring they can find where our surface fleet is by doing that. Um, not, I assume the enemy AI can't see exactly where we are, so that's probably what they're doing in order to detect us. Or maybe it's radar. They might have radar that can tell them where we are as well. Radar will show you where an object is located. It just won't tell you what that object is. So you'll know it might be a, a surface ship or an Air Force unit, but you won't know what type of unit it is. You'll just know essentially oh, we've, got a, we've got a blue dot there somewhere or a green dot there somewhere, uh, but we're not quite sure what it is. So it looks like we've got one, no, two light cruiser, no, one light cruiser, one heavy cruiser, several destroyers, and one battleship. And there we go. We've got enemy units uh, detected, uh, just not sure what they are. We've got multiple warships here to the south. So it looks like there's going to be two enemy forces closing in on us. Hopefully we can defeat them in detail. What that means is you defeat one, and then you turn to face and defeat the other uh, before they have a chance to unite and uh, face off against you. We could either do that, or we could split our force and move one force north to deal with one and, and have our other force move south. Uh, in a situation where you have a numerical advantage, splitting your force might be a feasible option, uh, but not one I intend to pursue here in this battle. I'd rather destroy one force first and then move south and destroy the other. Although they're not that far apart, so my guess is we won't be able to destroy them both that quickly. Anyway, the kind of the fog of war element of showing you the fact that there's a unit there but not what it is until it's in visual range uh, i think that's a really neat and appealing feature we've got our scout craft up we can see it looks like some dutch destroyers are coming in again not sure what that red x next to the flag means i don't know if it means that they're not as effective for one reason or another uh or what uh, i'm not sure if i have any troop transports on the southeast corner but i've got to keep at least two of them alive so i think if we lose more than one of the uh, of the convoy up there we're in trouble and may lose the battle you can see here uh, the main battle is about to be engaged. Meanwhile, we just ran some uh, sonar to make sure that there's no enemy submarines. I think in the next video what I'll do, I'm going to talk a little bit about the Battle of Java Sea and the historical engagements. But I also want to talk in more detail about the naval combat mechanics. Uh, I did more talking about the history of the ABDA command in this particular video than I did talking about the actual... Uh, gameplay mechanics, which is kind of reverse. Usually when I do something new in this series, I talk about the gameplay first and then talk about uh, the, uh, the historical elements after, but I kind of got in a little bit of a spiel, a little bit of a tangent, and I think things will be a little bit reversed in, the, in this particular two video set. This scenario will be cut apart into two different videos. Shouldn't be too difficult to do because, again, there's, what, 15 turns in, so we're about halfway through. Um, but anyway, guys, uh, I appreciate you tuning in. The surface engagement of the Battle of Java Sea is just being joined. Our carrier force is now moving to the south. We've got a support ship and a battleship moving to the south, as well as our cruisers and destroyers. We're all coming together for the final clash in this scenario against the main enemy force. And uh, with Now, I mentioned bringing this video to a close, and I'm going to do that, but there's one more thing I wanted to do here. I wanted to take a look at perhaps adding a few more units. You can see there on the left side we've got all of our land units which are not currently being used. We definitely could use a little bit more of a, a presence in terms of our air power. We only have one dive bomber unit. And now that we're going to be engaging this enemy fleet which has far more vessels than I thought would it would, uh, I'd like to go ahead and grab a torpedo bomber as well so we can look at using that against the enemy heavier ships. Uh, which uh, are less affected by dive bombing and more affected by torpedo bombers. So we'll go ahead and purchase one of those. We'll place it on the map and we'll go ahead and end the turn. And with that, we're going to go ahead and cut this video off here at this point and we'll split this, uh, this battle into two videos like we've been doing lately here as we watch the American side go through its turn uh, or the American, British, Dutch, etc. Um, 
But yeah, I, th I appreciate you guys tuning in thus far for this series. It's been a lot of fun. I've been enjoying myself quite a bit. And until next time, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching. Thank you a lot, guys. Uh, leave your comments, thoughts, etc. all in the description and the, uh, the comments thread. And uh, if you'd like me to change anything up or do anything differently, don't be, hes don't be shy. Go ahead and uh, let me know that as well. But until next time, guys, this is the Historical Gamer saying thank you for watching, and I'm out.